security debate on the topic of China's role in multilateral arms control. I think we will start right away with uh, the opening remarks by our director, Ambassador Thomas Greminger. Yeah, thank you, uh, Linda, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends. Uh, it's uh, once again a great pleasure uh, for me to welcome you all uh, to the GCSB for this uh, now uh, 13th uh, edition of the Gene uh, Geneva Security Debate. Today, we'll talk about China's role uh, in multilateral arms control. Uh, it's uh, obviously a highly relevant and, and timely topic for quite a number of reasons to which I will come back in uh, a minute. The Geneva security debates is a series of public discussions uh, which explores pressing and current security challenges. On a regular basis, we bring together leading thinkers, experts and policymakers for interactive discussions on a specific security challenge. The short-term goal of the Geneva security debates is to inform, provide new insights, stimulate joint reflections, and create networks uh, among policymakers and experts uh, here in Geneva and beyond. In the longer term, these events series seek to contribute to shaping a better global future. Today's Geneva security debate is special in that it is organized in partnership with the Friedrich Ebert uh, Foundation. And I'm very grateful for this collaboration and pleased to see that our organizations have successfully joined forces to offer this space for an open debate uh, on a, a, a very urgent security topic. And I should acknowledge here that uh, in the area of diplomatic dialogue, we have already uh, established uh, a, a trustful and fruitful cooperation with uh, the Vienna office uh, of the Friedrich Ebert uh, Foundation. Uh, we'll soon uh, launch uh, together a dialogue track uh, entitled Conversations about the Future of uh, European Security that should take us to 2025, uh, the 50th anniversary of the Helsinki Final Accord. Why does uh, arms control uh, uh, matter in today's world? And why is China's involvement uh, in it uh, so crucial? Um, when we speak about uh, arms control, we generally refer to any international control or limitation of the world's most powerful uh, weapons. Um, Arms control regulations target not only the use, but also the development, testing, manufacture, and deployment and exchange of weapons. Such regulations can be quantitative in nature. Examples are agreements between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War, which aimed at limiting the number of nuclear weapons and intercontinental ballistic missiles in their possession. Arms control regulations can also be qualitative in nature and prohibit a specific subset of weapons. For example, the Chem Chemical Weapons Convention bans the production and use of certain chemical agents. In the case of nuclear weapons, the uh, approach as promoted by the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, NPT, has been to prevent additional countries from acquiring nuclear weapons while recognizing the status and the responsibilities of a number of existing nuclear weapon states. I just wanted to introduce these few uh, definitional uh, notions uh, to now highlight the challenges that arms control faces in today's world. The reason for uh, these uh, uh, growing uh, challenges are both geopolitical trends and technological advances. The concept of arms control implies some form of cooperative efforts between states. States that are generally speaking antagonistic or at least in competition with each other. 
In this time of growing tensions in great power relations, arms control agreements have become both more important, but also much more difficult to reach and maintain. As a matter of fact, most of the arms control architecture built up in the latter stages of the Cold War and since the end of the Cold War has crumbled and uh, fallen apart. This is, for example, illustrated by Russia's suspension of the New START Treaty earlier this year, which was the last bilateral nuclear disarmament treaty in force. Arms control agreements can be concluded between two countries, bilaterally, or uh, a number of countries, meaning multilaterally. Today's focus is on multilateral arms control. And just as Russia suspends the last major arms control treaty, China is seen to be on track to massively expand its nuclear arsenal, as described in the Pentagon's most recent annual report. The United States uh, prepare for a new world in which Beijing, in addition to Moscow and Washington, will likely be atomic peers. But geopolitical competition is not only heating up at the global level. Regional developments in Asia are equally worrying. The deepening US-China strategic competition is fueling tensions in a region that is conflict-prone and suffers from structural insecurity. Due to growing mutual threat perceptions, countries are investing in their military buildup. Northeast Asian geopolitics today are marked by new bloc politics. The continuous threat of an isolated nuclear armed North Korea and an increasing focus on deterrence, much rather than dialogue. A major challenge in all this is that these developments, that is China's unprecedented nuclear expansion, but also the expansion of extended deterrence among US allies, occur in the absence of any arms control or disarmament measures, of any progress in risk reduction, or any meaningful strategic dialogue. With such unrestrained and unregulated competition, we face new risks of escalation. On top of all this, existing arms control mechanisms struggle to keep pace with technological innovation. Artificial intelligence and generally emerging technologies complicate the picture and add new dangers to a geopolitically tense environment. In today's world, arms control could be a key tool for managing strategic competition and containing risks. Arms control mechanisms could create transparency and predictability around the world's most dangerous weapons. Arms control arrangements, and they could also take the form of informal multilateral risk reduction efforts, could decrease the likelihood of conflict and, should conflict occur, decrease the potential destructiveness of conflict. Answers to the questions of why arms control? What forms of arms control? What role to China? And how to engage with China? I hope to hear during the next 70 minutes. I look very much forward to the discussion among our experts and the following Q&A session. Now I'm uh, very delighted and honored to welcome our distinguished speakers here in person and also uh, online. Welcome Dr. Oliver Meyer, Professor uh, Michael Stark, and uh, Dr. Sao online. Thank you for joining us for this very important discussion. Our speakers will shortly be introduced in more detail by our moderator, Dr. Linda Madus. I would also like to extend my appreciation to all our guests in the audience, here in this room and online. 
Welcome and thanks uh, for joining us. With this, I would like to hand it over to uh, Hayo Lanz, the director of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation's Geneva office, and I would like to thank him once more for this excellent partnership in organizing this Geneva Security Dialogue, and I'm sure it's not going to be a one-off. Hayo, the floor is yours. Yes, it's working. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends and colleagues. Thank you very much, Ambassador Griminger, uh, for your well, warm welcome. And many thanks to the Geneva Center for Policy, Security Policy for your immediate and positive response to our idea to jointly organize a Geneva security debate on this topic of today. Many of you will be familiar with it, but allow me to say a few words about the organization I represent. The Friedrich Ebert Stiftung is a German political foundation that will be 100 years old in two years' time. It was named after the Social Democratic Reichspräsident Friedrich Ebert, and it owes its origin and its mission to his political legacy. As a foundation with close ties to a political party, we base our work on the fundamental values of social democracy, freedom, justice, and solidarity. As an independent non-profit organization with offices in over 100 countries, we strive for free societies based on solidarity and equal opportunities, for vibrant and strong democracies, for economies that grow sustainably with decent work for all, for welfare states that provide more education and better health, and finally, we strive for countries that take responsibility for peace and social progress in Europe and the world. And it is this responsibility for peace that has brought us together here today. The report on arms control that we are about to discuss with uh, its two authors is part of a series of FES publications to examine Beijing's strategy in a number of different global policy areas. The overarching theme of the series is the future of multilateralism in the face of China's rise as a global power and the growing competition for values and norms. It seeks to address questions such as, how can we initiate a constructive process of political negotiation between Europe and China on the regulatory framework for global governance? In what areas is there potential for greater coordination and cooperation with China? And conversely, where should Europe push back and do its own groundwork, for example, to ensure that emerging and developing countries see it as a reliable partner? Other publications in the series are available for download from our website, and they include China's role in the multilateral trading system, China's global health diplomacy, China and the global financial architecture, China and its central bank's digital currency. But today we are here very honored to have our two authors, Dr. Oliver Meyer and Professor Michael Stark, as well as Dr. Tong Zhao from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace with us, to discuss China's role in multilateral arms control. With this, I would like to thank all of you for your presence and your interest in today's topic, and over to you, Linda. Thank you so much. So, Dr. Mayer, Professor Stuck, Dr. Zhao online, and all of our guests, welcome. Let me quickly introduce our distinguished speakers. Dr. Michael Stark is Professor of International Relations at Helmut Schmidt University, University of the Armed Forces, Hamburg. He has been a visiting professor and researcher at universities in China and the United States. And uh, very interestingly, he advised the foreign ministers of Germany and South Korea on foreign policy aspects of Korean unification. When asking Professor Stark about his research interest, he said if he had to summarize it in a few keywords, it would be East Asia the multipolar world order and arms control. When I read his CV, I was impressed by the breadth of his, of his expertise. And I think such expertise is exactly needed if we want to understand today's security challenges in, its, in their full complexity. So thank you for being here. Dr. Oliver Mayer is the policy and research director at the European Leadership Network. Prior to this, he was a senior researcher at the Institute for Peace Research and Security Policy. And before that, he was 
deputy head in the International Security Division of the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, SVP. He holds a PhD in political science from the Free University of Berlin and his expertise includes control of nuclear, chemical and biological weapons, multilateral disarmament and non-proliferation, Iran's nuclear program and European security. Dr. Mayer's profile as an arms control expert is very complete. In Germany, but also at the European and international level, he has held positions at all the important institutions and initiatives in the field. So we're very honored also to have you here. Now, when we were looking for an arms control expert from China who can maybe also be challenge our two other panelists here, there's one name that always pops up. And an expert who stands out and was literally recommended to us um, by everyone who we consulted. And this is Dr. Tong Zhao. Dr. Zhao is a senior fellow in the nuclear policy program at the Carnegie um, Endowment for International Peace. He's currently also a visiting research scholar at Princeton University's Science and Global Security Program. And this is from where he's joining us today. Dr. Zhao's research focuses on strategic security issues such as nuclear weapons policy, deterrence, arms control, non-proliferation, missile defense, hypersonic weapons, and China's security and foreign policy more broadly. He holds a PhD in Science, Technology and International Affairs from Georgia Institute of Technology. So a warm welcome to all of our speakers. We have uh, between 30 and 40 minutes for the panel discussion. We will then open up the discussion <coughs> for a Q&A session. Save all your important questions um, for, for the session at the end. But if you have urgent questions, um, please ask them as we go and keep them short. Now, I would like to start with a short opening question that goes to all the three panelists. And I would like to ask them, please explain to the experts and non-experts in the audience, in today's world, why should we care about arms control? And is it still an adequate tool for the security challenges that we are today facing? Some critics would probably question that. Dr. Maya, would you like to go first? Yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, thank you for the question and the invitation um, to speak at uh, this event. Um, my thanks go to GCSP for hosting and organizing it, to FAS for um, guiding us through the study, for asking us to write the study, um, which um, started out under very different political conditions. Um, and I should also say that I only joined the European Leadership Network Recently, so for me personally, this was written um, in my previous life uh, while I was senior researcher at the Institute for Peace Research and Security Policy in Hamburg. Um, to answer your question, um, why, um, why should we care about arms control, disarmament and uh, non-proliferation? Um, Thomas Kreminger already gave many important reasons um, why um, the issue um, remains um, relevant and uh, is becoming more relevant again. Uh, the most important reason, obviously, are the risks of um, nuclear conflict, of um, the great power competition escalating um, to the uh, nuclear uh, level. Um, for us in Europe, around Ukraine, but in other regions of the world, obviously, such uh, risks um, exist. Also, in the study, we tried to look beyond the nuclear issue, um, try to engage, uh, engage with the question of why it's important to um, work with China on preventing the spread of weapons and also increasingly dual use technologies that can be misused um, for creating particularly weapons of mass destruction, but also um, um, how important it is to engage China on humanitarian arms control, um, an area that's often neglected, um, trying to prevent um, um, damage and um, risks to the people who are affected by armed conflict. Um, and I think the point we're trying to make is that in all these different dimensions, um, it's essential to try to work uh, with China and that the chances and the likelihood of progress um, is greatly increased if we try to find ways to engage China. I think that's one of the main points we're trying to make. Thank you very much. Professor Stuck. why are we discussing arms control today? What is your answer to that? 
First, let me thank, for, uh, thank you for the invitation and also um, all the participants to join us here uh, in presence or online. Uh, I think the uh, answer is very easy. Uh, because we are living in very turbulent times, uh, a lot of volatility, uh, Russia's war of aggression, which has a poisoning impact uh, on nearly every um, uh, aspect of international relations, um, a very complicated uh, international situation uh, since the start of the so-called great power competition. Um, other debates, uh, for example, on uh, um, stronger participation of the global south in international affairs. Uh, and in this particular situation, I think we need a stabilizing instruments and tools. And if we look back uh, to the um, uh, East-West conflict in the 1960s, arms control was uh, such a stabilizing tool. And of course, it's not possible uh, to transfer arms control of the 1960s or 70s to the present times uh, in every aspect. But the general idea of arms control uh, as a stabilizing instrument uh, and uh, uh, stabilizing effect on international relations um, is true as it was in the 1960s or 70s. Uh, and um, additionally, I do not see any other instrument or, or tool with this kind uh, of uh, uh, effect. Not climate change, not uh, pandemics. So arms control is um, as high on the agenda as it was 50 years ago. Thank you very much. Arms control as an important mechanism, as an important tool to strengthen international stability, to strengthen global governance. So Dr. Zhao, is it still working or where do we see the importance of this tool? Well, uh, thank you. Um, I think it's, it's uh, widely recognized that uh, we need uh, China's uh, active role in uh, promoting international peace and stability, we um, also see uh, China's own uh, military modernization, including nuclear buildup, is having wide ripple effects uh, in, in the region of Asia Pacific, but also globally. Um, but I think one key uh, factor to uh, understand is um, China may not have met the international expectation in this field uh, because China's own thinking and behavior is driven by both fear and ambition. And its uh, increasing ambition to change the world uh, in its own uh, uh, wish is very much a result of its fear that uh, its own core national interests are being threatened, are being challenged. And it increasingly becomes disillusioned about the uh, possibility uh, to uh, talk through the differences with uh, its rivals. So that contributes to a power-centric mindset in Beijing uh, and makes Beijing believe that the only way to defend its interests uh, and to make the international community respect China is through the development and demonstration of material power. Uh, so that's where we are at. Um, we, you know, I think we, the international community has not paid enough attention to addressing the root cause of all the security dynamics we are seeing today, which is the fear part, which is the core part of China's incentive. And arms control, I think, is a process it offers an opportunity to address that underlying challenge through dialogue, through confidence building, and that's key. A second part, very quickly, I do think the risk of conflict is growing because of serious misunderstandings. Uh, uh, both sides, both China and uh, US-led Western countries believe the other party are interested in deliberately provoking a conflict to advance their geopolitical interests. So uh, we need to uh, understand how that 
deterrent only strategy developed and focused by the uh, Western countries run the risk of feeding into the Chinese fear and making China more likely to misunderstand and exaggerate Western uh, intentions towards China. So that's why I think arms control offers perhaps the only way to help both sides develop a more nuanced understanding of each other's thinking and policy and capability and therefore reduce the risk of a serious conflict. Thank you very much. And we'll come back to that later. I would like um, to start with a few questions that I would like to pose to Professor Stuck. So not only the president of the European Commission, the French president and the German foreign minister visited Beijing this spring, but also you, Professor Stuck. You returned from China a bit more than two weeks ago, I believe. And you were in the first German expert group after a several years break to travel to China and to meet with experts, think tanks and government officials. May I ask what uh, the, your general observations were? What were the topics that Chinese counterparts wanted to discuss with you? And high up on the agenda, how high up on the agenda were topics such as arms control? Yes, uh, I think it was really a privilege to uh, visit Beijing um, as early as uh, in April 2023. Uh, and uh, um, it was um, really impressive to see that uh, Corona in China is over, back to normalcy. And I think this is a very important message also for communications in international relations, uh, because this direct face-to-face uh, -face communication does not solve uh, problems, but it is necessary as a prerequisite uh, to uh, have certain options to solve problems uh, and to uh, avoid misperceptions and so on. So um, I think uh, if on a high political level or an expert level, it's very important. The second point is that uh, um, China is very much interested uh, in security dialogues with uh, the countries of the European Union and the European Union itself. Um, and especially with France and with uh, Germany. Uh, and in this respect, I think the uh, visit of Chancellor Olaf Scholz to Beijing uh, in November uh, 2022 uh, was a sort of icebreaker uh, because he established uh, discussions on hard security as a topic uh, in uh, bilateral relations between the European Union and China and the, uh, Germany and China. Uh, and the third aspect was that uh, uh, discussions on uh, arms control uh, and other aspects of uh, hard security uh, have been quite high on our agenda. We spent maybe uh, a third of this week discussing the impact of uh, Russia's war on aggression on uh, European security, but also on international relations. Uh, relations between uh, the European Union uh, and uh, uh, China, uh, but especially um, topics like uh, risk reduction, uh, stabilizing effects of uh, arms control on the multilateral international agenda, uh, but also um, confidence building uh, in the region uh, of the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and uh, to be frank, um, this was not uh, my uh, uh, first try to discuss these topics in Beijing. Uh, and to be frank, uh, four or five years earlier, it was quite more complicated, especially with between the European Union and China. So I think uh, I perceive a certain change on the Chinese agenda. And of course, China is not interested uh, in uh, international travel, uh, troubles, but China is interested in stabilizing the international situation. Uh, and there I see uh, common ground also in the field of uh, arms control. So um, I'm uh, uh, a little bit uh, optimistic. Uh, it was a start, also the high level visits, uh, but of course it was a start. Excellent. <clears throat> Now, I would like to set the scene a bit um, before delving more um, deeply into the topic of arms control and how to engage with China. I think to understand 
and uh, Dr. Zhao already started the discussion to understand uh, China's position on, on arms control. It's important to understand how China is perceiving its international security environment and also the security environment in the region. Um, could you say a bit, like in your analysis, um, what current uh, geopolitical and security challenges there are for China from a Chinese perspective at the international and at the in regional level? Yes, I think uh, I'd like to underline uh, the sentence of Tong Chao, fear and ambition, because I think this characterizes Chinese uh, politics uh, very precise. Uh, on the one hand, um, China is a rising power or perceives itself as a rising power, but I think it is a um, rising power. It's, uh, it's a second global power uh, on the international stage. Uh, it is a great power in the region uh, of East Asia and the Indo-Pacific. It uh, uh, has started to... Um, uh, not only participate in international debates, but um, on agenda setting in international debates. China is uh, very active in multilateral arms control and other forms of international cooperation. Uh, and uh, uh, I think um, to be a res uh, responsible great power is not only a slogan of Chinese foreign and security policy, but there is a certain uh, truth in it. Uh, and uh, uh, I think this is the aspect of uh, ambition. And uh, I think it was especially um, very impressive uh, to see that uh, many debates uh, that are prominent in uh, Europe or the United States um, are reflected in Beijing uh, in a, um, not in this kind of uh, um, yes, uh, turbulent uh, perceptions uh, we have um, in our debates. Uh, this was really very important. On the other hand, um, China is not a developing country, but um, a country, uh, or not a development country, but it is a developing country that in military terms, economic terms, political terms, also in terms of uh, political and diplomatic smartness, uh, it's not on a level with the United States of America. And I think this is very understandable because the Chinese process of reform and opening started in uh, 1978. It was unprecedented in world history. Uh, but um, to be a great power again, and China was a great power most of its in most of its history, you need a certain process of learning uh, and this process of learning, from my perception, needs more than 40 years. It's uh, something for a century uh, and so on. And uh, um, I think on the one hand, uh, China knows about uh, its uh, global potential and also uh, a lot of uh, relations with countries of the global south and so on, which are very important for China. On the other hand, uh, it's not the end of the development uh, of China in terms of especially of economy, military terms, technology, uh, and so on. And so I think we have to understand the China position um, deriving from the security dilemma uh, because the great power competition was not uh, um, an idea of China, born in China, but of course uh, China has done uh, something uh, to fuel this kind of great power competition, especially seen from the perspective of the dominating power, the United States of America. Um, so um, I think there is ambition of uh, China to be this kind of global responsible power, uh, to go on with its uh, development. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a certain fear to be encircled by the United States, uh, to be um, isolated. I think it's not possible to be isolated in terms of uh, technology development and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, I think this is a very critical uh, situation. And uh, therefore, I'm really convinced that it is now the time to start uh, dialogues and exchange uh, on all levels, because the last three years um, between China and other countries, 
um, I wouldn't say um, that they've been devastating, uh, but they are very bad because the, com the perceptions in China or um, of the rest of the world and the perception of China and other countries is often misleading and direct communications uh, opens the way uh, to uh, better understanding, to better perceptions and uh, to find common ground uh, in uh, some aspects that are very, in, uh, very important for international relations. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Dr. Mayem. So when discussing China's engagement in arms control, policy and research attention has focused a lot on the international level, on the dynamics and arrangements between great powers, US-China relations and the nuclear dimension usually is uh, prominently discussed. Now, the approach of your study is a different one. Could you explain a bit what your approach was and why you chose this approach? Yeah, we started out by asking ourselves where are the areas where engagement with China is most feasible from a German and from a European um, perspective. Um, and um, our working hypothesis from the outset was that um, from that perspective, the um, nuclear issue, even though uh, we are as concerned about China's rapid expansion of its nuclear capabilities and particularly the intransparent manner in which um, China is building up its nuclear arsenal, might not be the issue that is um, most promising in terms of engagement. Um, there had been attempts to... Uh, by Europeans to engage China on this issue. And it seemed to us, and we confirmed this hypothesis, I think, in, 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 the, in the writing of the, in the research on, on the report, um, that um, China is looking clearly towards the United States when it um, is um, building up its nuclear arsenal. Um, so we initially uh, broadened um, our remit and uh, took a broad view um, and looked at uh, China's policies um, on a range of um, disarmament, arms control, non-proliferation issues. Um, and um, we are hoping in the study to provide an overview of how China performs in these different um, issue areas. Um, one problem we uh, and a lot of researchers um, have to come to grips with is that it's very difficult to look into the Chinese policy processes on these issues. They largely remain a black box to us, so um, very grateful for Tong Zhao and other experts who uh, helped us out to some degree um, on that remark, or not on that aspect, but um, that remained a problem. So, you know, we, we took stock of um, how China has uh, performed over time and where it stands at the moment, and um, then we decided actually um, not to do an issue area by issue area review, but to identify some core principles that um, cut across um, the different arms control, disarmament, non-proliferation areas. And, but we also found um, some issues where China's uh, policies are ambivalent to some degree. And China itself is, um, China's policies um, fluctuate a little bit uh, between these different goals. And we focused um, on some of these issue areas. Great. And about this principles underlying Chinese arms control policy. And I've noticed that when I went through the literature, which is mostly Western literature, uh, on the topic that you always have this section on, on Chinese assumptions um, <clears throat> with regard to arms control. And you also have this section on the principles. Could you elaborate a bit what these principles are? Sure. Um, some of them have been touched upon already. Um, one um, pattern of behavior, obviously, is that China aspires to be a great power and sees itself as a great power and um, therefore um, competes with the United States um, and potentially other great powers um, militarily. Um, there's an arms race going on, uh, arms races actually in several areas, 
and um, um, China is um, obviously not willing at this stage to limit um, military capabilities in those areas where it sees itself as an advantage or where it hopes to uh, balance, particularly the United States, in an astromatic uh, manner. Nuclear is number one, but also hypersonics, other issue areas where China believes it has an advantage are um, China's you know, not willing to engage on hardcore arms control, uh, maybe risk reduction, but certainly not, um, not any kinds of, of limits. Um, China also is, you know, has a very centralized political system and um, therefore is very skeptical on um, governance-based approaches that involve multiple stakeholders. Um, China still sees arms control as an you know, old-style arms control between governments, um, but it's very reluctant to um, engage um, these new types of actors. That is at odds with uh, what we see uh, being pursued in several, um, um, particularly multilateral areas where codes of governance, rules of behavior um, are in fashion and are being advocated by many uh, countries. China doesn't really um, like to go down that road. Now, there are exceptions to that rule and they are quite interesting and we probably come to some one of these issue areas, um, but that certainly um, are two principles that you can find um, um, cut across many of the arms control, specific arms control fora. Thank you. And I was wondering if you could give us um, a brief overview of the multilateral arms control landscape um, and to explain a bit um, how China's engagement in it has looked like so far and, and maybe also um, <clears throat> refer back to the principles that you've outlined. Yes, Michael Stark um, has said um, China's um, arms control disarmament policies obviously has evolved. Um, engagement with the multilateral framework really started in the mid-1980s um, in the context of the economic opening of the country. And um, since then, I think, um, generally speaking, um, China has moved closer to the mainstream um, and in, is now engaged in many multilateral frameworks. I say that also because often, um, even in official uh, statements, you encounter the argument that China does not take part in arms control. Um, that is true when you're talking about nuclear arms control and also specific areas of arms control where it is about limiting uh, military capabilities, but there are plenty of um, arms control fora where China is engaged in from chemical, biological, um, uh, weapons conventions um, to the NPT, where China, uh, particularly at the last NPT review conference, has played a very um, um, uh, active role. We may not like the way China engages, but I think it's wrong to say that China is not taking part um, in these um, types of um, fora. What we found and where we argue it may be more promising to try to engage um, China is on those um, issue areas where China's policies are a bit conflicted. Um, and that um, includes obviously um, non-proliferation, particularly when it comes to regional non-proliferation uh, crisis. Um, China um, has been very engaged in the negotiations on the JCPOA. It, had, it was an active participant in terms of implementing um, the JCPOA until uh, the United States under the Trump administration decided uh, to no longer comply with the JCPOA. Um, and then, um, you know, now um, this is more conflicted between China's economic political interests in the regions um, in the region and its broader non-proliferation goals. The same argument um, you could make with regard to uh, Northeast Asia and, um, and North Korea to some degree. And to some degree, you could also make it on the humanitarian side of arms control, where uh, China, on the one hand, um, acts like um, other great powers. Russia, United States has not signed on to conventions against landmines, um, cluster munitions, um, but at the same time, it wants to um, keep on connections to the global south. 
Um, so it's participating as an observer in these conventions. It has signed onto the ATT while at the same time exporting arms, obviously for its geopolitical um, interests. So uh, these are areas where um, the um, Chinese arms control and non-proliferation policies are, um, are, are more ambiguous. And I think there are better entry points for a dialogue, particularly uh, for countries which do not consider themselves um, great powers, middle powers, smaller powers, um, like the Europeans. Um, and um, one of the findings um, and the arguments um, we make is that um, um, if you want to pursue these issue areas, it's probably better to do so on a technical expert level than rather to engage on the political broader questions which are very contentious. Um, that's not very exciting for some policy makers. It takes a longer time, but that's one general thrust of our recommendation. Thank you very much. Now I would like to turn to Dr. Zhao again. Um, you or in the, in the study uh, written by Dr. Mai and Dr. Uh, Professor Stuck, it says that Beijing is, a pa is passive in the multilateral arms control architecture. Now, you already mentioned it, but I would like to ask uh, more explicitly, in your analysis, uh, what are the main concerns of China that explain its behavior, its engagement, or its reluctance to engage in arms control? Well, thank you. Um, I think most importantly, um, China has not been convinced that um, the other parties are genuinely interested in uh, equal arms control uh, cooperation. Um, China has this uh, genuine and very deep uh, suspicion that arms control is now being used as a tool by the United States uh, to uh, prevent uh, China's uh, legitimate development of uh, national uh, defense capability. It was being it is uh, being uh, being used as a tool to uh, cont contain China. Um, so, uh, given that uh, perception, uh, China is taking a very cautious approach, uh, and uh, is very uh, 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 it has every fear that. Uh, there, there are traps being uh, set up uh, for China. If China is not careful, it would fall into the traps and uh, unnecessarily uh, constrain uh, itself. Um, so we have to, uh, fundamentally, we have to persuade China that that's not necessarily the case. China has been developing its defense policies, uh, military capabilities, according to its own perception of how its rivals especially the United States, uh, is conducting defense policy and uh, approaching arms control issues. So that deep suspicion is the most important thing to address. And arms control, I think, is a process where you can use reasoning and persuasion uh, to help China develop a more nuanced, a more sophisticated understanding. Uh, you know, we talk about the lack of uh, the Western countries understanding into China's domestic thinking. But similarly, China doesn't have deep understanding about the internal debates on security issues, on arms control issues, on proliferation issues in the United States and many other Western countries. So that's, uh, I think, really uh, important. Um, another you know, concern China used to have is um, China has this traditional belief that arms control and uh, cooperative security can only be possible through a top-down process, right? We need to have strategic level agreement to become friends. And then we can work on the operational level, working level issues. Um, it is increasingly rejecting the Western preferred approach of bottom-up uh, uh, cooperation, the recent Chinese rejection of the concept of building guardrails to the U.S.-China competition, I think, is a recent evidence of that. And 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 we we need you know uh, this rejection actually comes from China's uh, top level uh, leadership because at the operational level, 
over the past decades, we do see the Chinese experts, the practitioners on the front line. They are increasingly um, used to working level trust building. Uh, they are increasingly convinced of the value of having you know, expert level exchange, track to level discussions to start concrete progress at the uh, operational level uh, in the hope that it will have a gradual effect um, at a, a higher uh, decision making. Um, so I think that means we there is opportunity to continue engaging at the operational level. Um, and, and that requires smart design of topics, uh, specific uh, issue areas uh, to discuss with the Chinese counterparts. And here I think uh, European countries have a unique opportunity uh, because it connects to uh, another Chinese longstanding concern, which is China is being singled out by the international community uh, on arms control issue. But China doesn't want to be that. China wants to be part of a multilateral process. Uh, and, and here, I think, uh, especially uh, when we consider current Chinese overall foreign policy approach, which emphasizes engagement with European countries in the hope that um, you know, Europe and the United States wouldn't cooperate too closely to contain China. So China is now very interested in uh, talking with uh, European countries on these issues. Uh, and if European countries are willing to lead a multilateral process and then invite Chinese American experts or officials into this process, I think that will be uh, much more uh, appealing to the Chinese part. Uh, there are other things, but given time li limit, perhaps I should stop here. Thank you. Thank you, excellent. I think uh, a lot of what you said also uh, relates to this question or debate of principle. Do How much trust do we need to start arms control? Is arms control the end goal or is it rather about the process and through the process that we build trust, right? So thank you very much for that. Now, um, the two authors of the study, they made very concrete suggestions of how to engage with China on the topic of arms control. And um, I think what is very interesting is that um, you first identified the ambivalences, as you call them, or, or gaps that uh, you see in China's um, policies on arms control. And then building on that, you say it's, um, yeah, with regard to these ambivalences that uh, Europe should try to engage with China. Now I, now I would like to invite you to explain a bit what your concrete suggestions and policy recommendations are for European countries. Yeah, I can, shall I start? Um, and then uh, Michael can um, add. Um, generally, I think we are following the line that Tong Zhao also outlined um, and um, um, come to the conclusion that, um, you know, keeping and opening up channels of communication is a value in itself in this um, situation. Um, that um, not overburdening um, such um, talks um, with expectations is probably um, very valuable to be specific in terms of topics, not to mix um, topics. Um, and, um, um, you know, that does not mean that you should bypass the important topics, but um, um, to have a more long-term view in terms of such um, Engagement. Some of the um, issue areas where China um, also might be interested, obviously, is uh, verification, for example, risk reduction. There's a dialogue among the P5 or the Nuclear 5 um, on risk reduction that um, Europeans also have an interest in. Um, there are initiatives by Europeans on this that can help um, support uh, nuclear risk reduction. Um, it um, certainly would make sense to try to bring China into or back into um, some initiatives of like-minded states. There's the International Partnership for Nuclear Disarmament Verification, where China um, was involved in um, and has withdrawn um, to some degree. Is it possible to bring China back in 
in such um, uh, practically practical oriented initiatives. They're still creating the environment for nuclear disarmament initiative, where I understand China is actually actively involved, unlike Russia. Um, so that's something where um, um, it might be useful to um, um, engage China on, um, also to get a better understanding of where the Chinese um, expert community and also people at the working level, as Tong Zhao has said, um, um, might have expertise that we might be interested in. You know, it's not um, only, um, this is not a one-way exercise. Um, so those are some of the issues that I maybe want to flag, risk reduction verification and um, um, also these informal networks that we have, um, which we could build upon, but uh, Michael probably has um, other issues to add here. Uh, yes, I think uh, first it's very important to um, uh, perceive this uh, process of uh, trust building uh, between China and other countries, especially European countries, is a step-by-step -step, uh, process. Uh, and um, the more successful the first steps are, the more uh, prospects uh, we will have for the future. I think it's very important that uh, um, most European countries or important European countries are not perceived as uh, rivals or enemies in Beijing. And trust building is uh, much easier between, the United, uh, between uh, China and European countries uh, than between um, China and the United States. I think uh, an additional topic uh, might be the regional conflicts, North Korea, uh, Iran. I think that is obvious. Um, another topic uh, is uh, our confidence building and security building measures. Uh, this is not. Uh, this is also the multilateral level, but not the multilateral level um, on uh, um, the global arena, but uh, on the regional uh, arena in East Asia and so on. Uh, in the moment, it's not very high on the Chinese agenda. Uh, they focus on military contacts uh, to avoid clashes with the United States. But uh, I think um, it's possible to first to share some experiences. Uh, some practical experiences uh, from Germany and other countries with China, uh, and then also some uh, historical experiences. Um, and I'd like to add a last uh, possible uh, topic that are export controls. Uh, I think this is also uh, of some interest uh, from China, uh, for China as far as I heard it. Uh, so there are enough topics and I think it's the best way to start with uh, two or three of them to build common ground uh, and then uh, to uh, go on as far as possible um, if there is uh, a certain trust, uh, because if there is no trust and uh, the other side is perceived as uh, a power just outmaneuvering China, uh, then uh, it will not be successful, of course. Thank you very much. So after reading your study, I was very convinced. So these are good ideas, good suggestions, straightforward. So I would like to ask um, Dr. Zhao to comment on these suggestions and maybe also to <clears throat> share what from, yeah, from your, your viewpoint is a good way to engage with China. Are there any short-term measures, long-term measures that we should keep in mind? Are there any low-hanging fruits, for example? Um, thank you very much. I uh, very much agree that uh, for the near term, uh, risk reduction is uh, really important uh, because I'm personally very concerned about the growing risk of uh, military conflict, uh, not least due to uh, increasing and serious misunderstandings. Um, however, um, a concerning uh, sign is the uh, rejection of uh, building guardrails. Um, by uh, senior Chinese uh, officials recently, um, you know that makes uh, substantive discussion and engagement on concrete risk reduction measures a little harder. Um, so we may have to, you know, given how uh, careful, how cautious uh, China is approaching this topic, we may have to more seriously consider starting with 
issues that China has demonstrated a strong interest in, such as its uh, uh, longstanding insistence that we have, if we are really serious about reducing nuclear risk, for example, we have to start with no first use policy of nuclear weapons. Um, I, I do think, you know, Chinese officials and experts, they genuinely believe that uh, no first use is uh, the most sensible uh, uh, approach to address uh, nuclear risk and to uh, start a process of reducing the role of nuclear weapons um, and, and uh, gradual nuclear arms control. Um, so uh, this appears to be the only uh, specific issue China is uh, willing to uh, engage on. Um, and there are uh, many internal concerns uh, in the United States and its allied countries about no first use. Uh, but I think it's time to have a serious uh, debate uh, and re-examine uh, the pros and cons. And there are also always ways to um, adapt no first use uh, to specific geographical areas or you know, not to pursue a universal no first use commitment, but perhaps uh, in a, a bilateral uh, context. And maybe you know only limit it, uh, only limit that commitment to the most dangerous military flashpoints, such as Taiwan Street, right? So uh, I think there are opportunity to uh, uh, fine tune the no first use uh, uh, agreement to the point that it will become more acceptable to both uh, United States, uh, its allies, and China. And, and, and make it a good entry point to, uh, to engage China. Um, long term, I think it's, uh, you know, we, we really need to start uh, a long term capacity building process because China does have a lot of genuine and traditional and deeply embedded suspicion about the concept of, of arms control. Chinese official experts, they have some experience in multilateral arms control negotiations like CTBT but they don't have much experience in bilateral uh, or, uh, or uh, minilateral arms control models, especially when it comes to reducing uh, military capabilities. Uh, and Chinese experts, including technical experts, they genuinely um, worry that you know, verification uh, can be uh, designed um, uh, to uh, benefit the stronger, the militarily stronger party. Uh, and uh, be used as a way to uh, infringe on national secrets of the military uh, weaker party. Uh, so you, we have to help Chinese experts uh, develop a deeper understanding of how the verification technologies, how the verification pr procedures, the inspection procedures actually work on the ground. Uh, so that all requires time and extensive engagement, not only with the diplomats, but also Chinese weapon engineers, the civilian experts, the military experts, um, you know, uh, it broaden the scope of the engagement to cover a much wider part of the Chinese bureaucracy. That would be uh, very important to lay the long, uh, long term ground uh, for future arms control cooperation with China. Thank you very much. And now I would like to open <clears throat> the discussion. And um, oh, great! But you see a few hands up here. Um, okay, I see four questions. I think we can collect those, and then I'm sure we'll also have questions online. Please. Now we're switching. Um, we have a very modern system. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're not using our mics anymore, so please. Uh -huh. Okay. Loudly. Very good. Very good. Uh, I'm Paolo Pauli <coughs> from uh, UNIGIR. Thank you for a very interesting discussion. <coughs> uh, just uh, I, I wanted to follow up on uh, something that Tong Zhao said uh, uh, about the China kind of being singled out, and um, I want to ask everyone: uh, What's your opinion on this uh, idea that China is uh, would participate uh, more easily, more readily? in multilateral uh, arms control uh, processes uh, rather than in bilateral. Uh, and uh, so do you think that there is something there uh, or maybe maybe it's, it's wrong? Uh, and uh, to follow up on that, uh, just the discussion that we had uh, with a colleague the other day, 
Uh, speaking of multilateral uh, arms control processes, uh, the, the, the feeling is that the interest in FMCT is kind of a tempered off, which is seems to be exactly the wrong time to abandon the idea. And I think that everybody should be uh, just be there, kind of uh, uh, carrying it on a flag that let's start this uh, process. Uh, and uh, what do you think? Uh, would it be useful, helpful, possible, realistic? Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe we already two questions. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Andrea, because you also with Unity here. Uh, great report, and I really enjoyed how broad it is. So you covered a lot of ground, but. Uh, and actually, Jun Zhao went ahead of me with this question. When you were looking at the middle ground, suggesting your proposals, you were looking on the things the West would want from China and then looking into, you know, what China can do about it. You haven't started with what China wants and then maybe going with that and saying what West can do. And Jun Zhao had a great example about no first use, which you know China is ready to go and talk about no first use any day, but the West like, nah, we're not interested, so we're not going and talking. The other thing would be uh, PPWT, of course. And then again, you mentioned it and said like, well, the West is not interested. And that's, that's it with your recommendations. So, so you don't say like, maybe the West should look into those issues. So my question would be, what was your reasoning in not going for what China wants? And yeah, thank you. Take one more question. Uh, Richard Hale, just an ordinary citizen. Uh, thank you very much for an excellent report, the two authors and the Stiftung, of course, who supported it. I thought your suggestions were so sensible that they probably will not be adopted. I have two very short questions. Uh, the first one is for Dr. Zhao. You mentioned misunderstanding uh, with China, or China might misunderstand. What is there to misunderstand about the U.S. intent to maintain economic, military, and political dominance through economic aggression and military expansion? And for Dr. Stark, I think historically one could argue that arms control existed already in ancient times, now and then. And we have the great example after World War I. And basically none of that ever worked because the stronger power finally decides, or the weaker power decides, who cares, we're going to rearm. Could you comment on what the prospects might make it different in the future? Thank you. Great. I think we'll go first to Dr. Zhao. I hope you were able to hear the questions that were addressed to you. Would you like to go first? Yes, um, thank you. Perhaps um, I should start with the last question. What's the Chinese misunderstanding of American intent to maintain its uh, economic and technological uh, predominance in the world? Um, I think here, um, Chinese Chinese perception is yes, China uh, the U.S. Uh, you know is you know the only goal of the U.S. is to maintain its uh, hegemony, is to maintain its international predominance. Um, it has nothing to do with China's own behavior or China's own uh, ambition um, for changing uh, international institutions. Um, um, but I don't think that's an accurate understanding of American intention. The reason the U.S., if you, if you, the Chinese argument is all of the troubles is caused by the structural change international balance of power, right? So simply because China has been successful in developing, in narrowing the power gap, that the U.S. becomes increasingly desperate to contain China in order to maintain its predominance. Uh, but the U.S., I think, I think to some extent acknowledge that American interest in maintaining predominance, but the U.S. also thinks, you know, China's own behaviors, including China's increasingly, uh, you know, um, so-called aggressive uh, foreign policy, security policy, resulting from its increasingly centralized internal decision-making system, uh, the reported, you know, domestic suppression, uh, et cetera. Uh, you know, China increasingly challenge, more openly challenge, Amer uh, you know, uh, Western values. And, and principles, both domestic and international. And this applies to their disputes over Hong Kong, uh, uh, Xinjiang, et cetera. That, uh, you know, uh, the China doesn't recognize any of that part contributing to Western concern and to the American determination to prevent China's uh, 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 dominance. Um, so I think that's, that's the part that we need more uh, political level uh, discussion. 
because that di directly feeds into the Chinese, you know, fear and ambition uh, incentive, right? The China has an increased ambition to erode American global uh, influence exactly because it thinks there is no way uh, that the U.S. would uh, accept China as is uh, because Ch the U.S. is only interested in maintaining hegemonism. Um, uh, so China has to, you know, uh, overrun or, you know, uh, fundamentally uh, change uh, American predominance and to establish and assert Chinese influence through power development. Um, so that's, you know, a major a driver of the military competition we are facing today. Thank you. Professor Stark. Yes, uh, thank you very much for um, the very good questions. And uh, um, I'd like to address uh, the uh, political framework for arms control. Uh, your question, but I think uh, it was uh, part of other questions as well. First, I think it's uh, necessary to understand arms control uh, as a process finding a compromise. And compromise means that uh, uh, none of two sides or several uh, sides will get everything uh, it wants. And uh, that has to be realized uh, once more. But what is uh, more important um, is that uh, in general some technical steps uh, in the direction of arms control, especially verification or other aspects are possible. But um, more important steps are only possible if um, especially the United States and China reach a certain understanding on how they see the international, uh, how they see their own role in international relations uh, and find maybe a certain uh, new balance um, uh, in a um, evolving multipolar world, uh, world order. Uh, and uh, I think it's very important uh, to realize that there is the West, that there is China, but there is something like the Global South, and that the Global South does not like to take part in a great power competition between China and the West. And uh, if we do not realize this um, from a Western perspective, we will not be successful with our strategies. The second point is that um, uh, seen from the point of uh, historical experiences, uh, of course, uh, arms control was not successful all the time. Uh, it was uh, quite successful uh, to um, reduce risks in the, uh, from the 60s uh, to the 80s. Uh, and then it was really uh, successful as a disarmament process after the end of the Cold War. Uh, but um, uh, yes, uh, thinking into the future, I think the basic question is, do we need uh, a new Cuba moment? Has the uh, process of uh, armaments and arms race get out uh, of control, uh, get, uh, has risk reductions, has it, uh, uh, should it be out of control? And then do we need really this new uh, Cuba moment uh, to um, establish a new mindset uh, of uh, um, cooperation between uh, great powers? I think seen in uh, the light of historical experiences, it is not necessary to go uh, the way uh, as it was, uh, as we have seen it in the 50s and 60s, uh, and uh, there might be a shorter and more successful uh, way to um, better and cooperative um, relations. And the third point is that um, uh, all European nations or most European nations uh, share the historical experience of decline. Uh, and the United States uh, do not share this experience of historical decline. That's something new for them. Uh, and I think there are certain dangers connected uh, with uh, this as a matter of fact. 
um, because uh, the political leadership uh, in the United States on both sides, Republicans and Democrats, uh, are convinced that the United States will stay at the top of the, or will sit at the top of the table uh, for the rest of the history. I think this is um, totally flawed. Uh, as a, um, on, for a lot uh, of uh, uh, reasons. Uh, and uh, I think um, it's uh, really necessary that the United States political establishment realizes uh, that uh, the sort of um, uh, decision making of former centuries that one power is prevailing and the other is not uh, on the uh, international scene anymore, that this is an um, uh, experience of the past, but it's not the 21st century. That means for a number of reasons, it, not it is not possible to contain China. It's not possible to isolate Ch China, global south. So you have to find modes of cooperation and the result is um, arms control as one mode of co cooperation. Uh, so I think, uh, and uh, therefore I'd like to uh, underline those three points. Um, you might find uh, practical solutions for some aspects, but uh, in general, uh, I think the political framework is very important. Uh, and uh, I see a certain European role there uh, because um, the, UP, the Europeans have their certain um, historical experiences, but uh, I think the Europeans are not interested uh, in such a sort of great power uh, competition we've seen in the East-West conflict with all the nuclear risks, with all the confrontations, with all the effects in the global south and so on and so on. So it's better to find a better path and the better path is cooperative security. Thank you. Dr. Mayer. Yeah, thank you. Um, let me try to pick up maybe um, some of Pavel's and Andre's um, question. Um, the question on, you know, bilateral or multilateral, better, um, more promising, desirable. Um, for us, I think, um, obviously, we had a bias towards the multilateral side of things because we're looking at this from the German, European middle power initiative, and um, there are no bilateral um, arms control discussions between um, China and Europeans, for example. So obviously, um, one way um, to engage China is through the multilateral um, sphere. Um, but obviously, you know, that's an area where China um, is engaged in, in different degrees and with, you know, its own specific uh, interests and um, sometimes, you know, um, disturbing ways of engagement. Um, but it's, it's, it's something that um, obviously um, we can use um, and we should use. And, you know, there are um, obviously there's an overlap between the bilateral, also US-Russian agenda and um, the multilateral sphere. And increasingly, um, Russia's attack on Ukraine has um, an impact on basically all multilateral uh, frameworks now, and Russia is you know, being spoiler in all of these um, frameworks. And that throws the question into the open, how does China um, uh, react um, to Russian policies, which are not always in China's interest. And um, we have seen over the last year um, very interesting reactions by China to that, which I think Europeans and other countries may want to explore in more detail. Um, China did not side with Russia at the NPT review conference on Ukraine. On other issues, yes, but obviously it was not very happy about the outcome of the review conference and Russia blocking consensus agreement. China probably wasn't very happy that um, um, something that it invested a bit of political capital in, in the BWC, the Tianjin guidelines on biosecurity, fell by the sidelines um, because of the deals uh, that had to be made at the BWC review conference to accommodate uh, Russia's interest to have a final document. Um, so um, there's a tension here. The FMCT mentioned by uh, Pavel, Obviously, it's an issue where this is at the center um, because um, the question of a moratorium uh, on the production of the material for weapons purposes would have an impact on 
Chinese nuclear buildup, and you know, it's important for uh, Europeans to call out um, um, Chinese um, irresponsible behaviors here, particularly the lack of transparency also uh, when it comes to fissile material stocks, and you know, that's a precondition for engaging on this question. So there are these linkages between the multilateral and the bio, bilateral agenda. I think Europeans um, can help to foster um, some of these discrepancies in Chinese policies, um, also on chemical weapons, for example, where China portrays itself, and it is, uh, has been a victim of mm -hmm. biological weapons use um, by Japan. At the same time, it's blocking progress in the Chemical Weapons Convention on accountability. For me, that doesn't sit very well together. Um, so these tensions, I think, um, is something that Europeans and other countries can highlight and see whether there's room um, for a dialogue here. Um, and um, obviously, when, as you know, Tong Zhao also has said, if you start at the political level and highlighting this, you know, China will not, uh, is unlikely to uh, pick up this offer of dialogue. Um, but maybe there are technical issues, low level ways of engagement, and uh, see whether we can um, uh, get some traction into the Chinese debate on these issues. Thank you. So we'll take. Two questions, one here and one online, uh, from the online audience, and then we'll do the final round of statements. Please. Thanks very much. Uh, Zachary Pagan, researcher at the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels. Wonderful to see you. Um, I have a conceptual question and a more practical question. Uh, the conceptual question builds on the comment of the gentleman before, which is, um, it was mentioned during the panel by Tong Zhao that the current uh, deepening geopolitical confrontation is rooted primarily in fear. Uh, and therefore, it makes sense that trust building, confidence building is the way to counteract fear. Um, but if the current contest is also rooted in fundamentally divergent normative visions for how to organize the global and regional security spaces, how might confidence building measures of arms control look different if that is indeed, uh, you know, if we're dealing in effect with different normative visions of two circles of a Venn diagram which may not intersect? Uh, that's the conceptual question. Uh, the more practical question um, has to do with, I um, mean, Oliver, you just mentioned uh, Ukraine. I'm wondering if anyone on the panel can perhaps um, shed some light or provide some insights into how China is thinking about both of these issues simultaneously and how these issues are connected, the Ukraine issue and the arms control issue, um, because while they may at first appear to be tangentially related, they're nonetheless connected through the notion of security architectures, um, uh, 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 security guarantees, and even you know which geostrategic theaters are likely to be prioritized in the context of armed control, whether it's Europe uh, or Asia uh, at any given time. So uh, how exactly is, is China thinking about this in sort of a nuanced balance between these issues and how might, how might we Europeans and, and North Americans um, engage with China given the complex equilibrium in China's thinking on these two issues, especially in the context of an increasingly polarized debate in, in the West about China. Thank you. Please, Alice, that? Um, so that person is asking what are some of the potential areas for cooperation between China and the major powers in the field of multilateral arms control, and how might these areas be further developed in the future? Oh, that's a very broad question. Um, Ciao. Maybe start with you. This is also your final, will be your final statement, please. Well, thank you. Um, I, I think the, the reason uh, China and uh, the Western countries increasingly disagree on international normative issues is because of their, is partially because of their uh, increasing uh, and genuine information gap and perception gap. Uh, we have to recognize that, you know, uh, there is a huge information asymmetry between China and uh, the Western countries. And they increasingly develop very divergent, if not opposite, understandings on basic factual issues. And, and this very much relates to our arms control discussion because, for example, on the issue of uh, Ukraine war, the majority of Chinese experts, not just the you know, general public, but very you know, uh, senior experts, technical experts, they genuinely believe that the U.S. has been using the bio labs in, in Ukraine and other countries to develop, you know, uh, uh, illegal biological weapon capabilities. Right? It's it's that type of genuine.
disagreement on basic factual issues. That makes China draw draw the conclusion that the Western countries they have no credibility in their uh, you know uh, 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 promoting of uh, uh, norms and principles. You know they are violating all the principles all the time, and they are just blatantly lying on what they are doing. And with this understanding, they then draw the conclusion that there is not very much value to try to persuade and reason with the Western countries because they are knowingly lying in order to advance their very selfish geopolitical interests. So it's all about power politics, power games. It's, it's, it's a world of you know, anarchy. You know, uh, that type of you know, social Darwinism uh, thinking is the fundamental challenge, but it's a result of many genuine disagreements on basic factual issues. And maybe arms control is one way to start substantive dialogues between the experts. And by the way, due to the information asymmetry and partly due to the COVID, the expert communities between the two sides are decoupling, right? This is more serious than the often talked about you know, economic decoupling. When the expert community cannot be on the same page on basic factual issue, that's where the problem become. But this is also where I think more substantive and extensive exchanges can help narrow that information perception gap. And there are many specific um, you know, uh, policy issues. You know, China misunderstands the US nuclear posture uh, review uh, um, policies. They, uh, you know, they genuinely believe the US is uh, uh, interested in fighting limited nuclear war. Um, so all of that types of disagreements, uh, uh, misunderstandings contribute to a uh, very uh, cynical Chinese view of American belief and belief in and adherence with international norms and, and you know, uh, principles of reducing the role of nuclear weapons, et cetera. So we, we have to tackle that much broader uh, challenge through expert level exchange to gradually and step by step narrow the perception gap and reduce misunderstandings. Maybe that's the only way that we can, in the long run, hope to uh, build a common understanding about norms um, and international principles. Thanks very much. So very short final statements by Dr. Mayer. Yeah, just to, to echo uh, what Tong Zhao has said, um, I think um, you know, we take the same approach that uh, these discussions, potential discussions with China, um, should not only be seen as a dependent variable of great power uh, relations, that, but that discussions on these issues can hopefully contribute to improving um, these discussions to reduce misunderstandings. Um, to give one concrete example, we um, heard in our discussions from several people that China, many Chinese experts, for example, believe um, Russian propaganda when it came to chemical weapons attacks in Syria, when it came to the accusation that there are bioweapons labs in Ukraine. Um, and, um, you know, those kind of misinformation, hopefully in, in a dialogue, one can help to misspell, to inform each other. But for that to happen, I think it's very important that also from our side, um, we um, do not um, frame this um, Topic and arms control and non-proliferation generally as you know being part of this great power conflict also be the democracies and autocracies um, that we move beyond this kind of dichotomy and framing in this context. Thanks. Professor Stuck, very last word is yours. <laughs> yes, um, first uh, I'd like to underline uh, that uh, communication is very necessary. Uh, and as both my colleagues uh, stated, uh, communication on an expert le level should be isolated from uh, the framework of great power competition and so on. It's really essential. I'd like to add a few last sentences on Ukraine. Uh, I think uh, Ukraine, um, the, uh, an ongoing war in Ukraine is not in China's interest. On the other hand, uh, the um, Chinese uh, um, uh, 
perceive, this is a Chinese position, I, refer the, uh, I uh, represent the Chinese position here, um, uh, on Ukraine, uh, they are convinced that the United States are not really interested in Chinese mediation. And I think they have certain good arguments because two weeks ago, um, uh, the Brazilian president visited uh, China and he proposed some, uh, or he was going with some proposals, no weapon deliveries <coughs> from both sides, and uh, the response from Washington was not very positive. That means in uh, rhetorical terms, uh, it was uh, quite rude. And uh, um, the United States in the moment, uh, from the Chinese perspective, are not interested in such kind of uh, mediation. On the other side, China is prepared to uh, mediate in the future, but it will go on step by step. Now it has nominated uh, um, a person uh, who uh, may offer his uh, diplomatic um, services. Uh, and there will be uh, maybe more in the future. I think it's quite uh, interesting uh, to uh, remember that as early as in 2014, uh, China offers its, uh, its uh, mediation on Ukraine to the Europeans and uh, the United States, uh, but uh, there was no um, positive reaction from uh, that side. And in general, I think... Um, um, China perceives Ukraine uh, as a turbulence in international relation uh, that is out of control uh, and in the interest of its peaceful development, which is central to Chinese uh, political strategies. It has no interest in uh, such an ongoing conflict. So we will see in a step of uh, step by step uh, process some Chinese moves. Um, to um, get more control of the situation. But I think it will, will not happen in the near fu future, maybe in the preceding month. Uh, but it's on the, uh, it's on the uh, Chinese agenda and it's really the issue of uh, peaceful uh, international relations as a framework uh, for the further rise of uh, China, so national interest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to the speakers today. Thank you very much for coming. It's a Monday lunchtime, so we appreciate your presence here. Thank you very much also to Friedrich Ebert Foundation. Thank you to my GCSB team, Mareva Rodui, Florian Goulet, Alice Schroeder, and uh, Tobias Knappe. Our next Geneva Security debate will take place in a month from now on June 8th, and we look forward to having to seeing you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.